All right. Well, welcome everyone to another webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Datastax Vector. And this is a really cool, this is one that I'm really looking forward to because I've known about it before you did. And I've been excited to share this with the rest of the Cassandra community out there. So this is a first look at it. Um, so I, I'm here with Aaron Morton and Patricia Gorla. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move this over to Aaron here shortly, but just so you know who I am, if you've never met me before out in the world, uh, my name is Patrick McFadden. Um, I have been working with Apache Cassandra for about ten years now, so that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about this. But before this, I was a I was an architect and I worked on developing applications on the old internet for a long time and ran Cassandra in production. Um, I've been at DataStax for a long time talking about a, uh, Apache Cassandra. And part of what I'm, my whole mission is making it easier for you to use. And um, that's why I'm really excited today about this because this is actually what we're gonna do. So um, let's move on to an uh, Aaron. I think you can take yeah. it from here. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Aaron Morton and uh, we'll introduce Patricia in a minute as well. Uh, I've been using Cassandra for about 10 years as well. I started using it when I was working at a company called Weta Digital and we were making Avatar the movie. Thought, you know what, these databases are kind of fun. Uh, started a company called The Last Pickle back in March 2011. Spent nine years working with people all around the world using Apache Cassandra. And the beginning of this year, I thought, you know, it's about time I went to Datastax. So March this year, uh, the last pickle joined Datastax, and it's been an incredibly fun and exciting three months. Feels like the right place and the right time, and we're really excited to be here. Patricia, do you just want to give a, a brief introduction, and then we'll move on? Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Patricia Gorla. I started using Cassandra uh, back in, in 2013, actually, um, and uh, when we were helping uh, helping different people get started with, uh, with Cassandra. Um, I worked uh, with Aaron uh, at The Last Pickle, um, and, uh, and I also worked at Apple on the largest Cassandra clusters in the world. And I'm very excited to be uh, here with you all and uh, here at Datastax, um, uh, working as a solutions architect. So let's dive in. Thanks. So as Patrick said, we're gonna talk today about a thing we've made called Vector. Vector is to, here to solve a problem that we think a lot of people have. And that is that it's hard to be consistently successful with Apache Cassandra and Datastax Enterprise. Like any piece of software, there's a learning curve that you need to go through. And as a community, we're working hard to get Cassandra 4.0 out and to make it easier for people to use Cassandra. It's a distributed system though, so there's still always gonna be some issues. And by consistently successful, we mean you can make a system that runs really well on your first month, but how's it gonna run six, 12 months later? Things change. So it could be that your workload shifts as you become more successful users start to use the application in ways you hadn't thought about that changes the workload going through. You have to upgrade your servers, that new hardware, move to a different cloud provider, and that can make things complicated. There's new features that can be added to Cassandra or to your application that changes things, and there's better way to solve the problems than before. And probably the hardest one is staff turnover. The people that create the systems initially move on to other projects or leave your company and you bring on new people. How do you bring them up to speed and get their skills up to where they need to be as quickly as possible? So what we've done with Vector is create what the uh, create a service that fits into the category of AI ops. Now, it's, it's a category, but really what Vector does is we continually assess how Cassandra has been used, and we provide near real-time expert advice, knowledge, and skills, all around this idea of making operators and developers, both those groups of people, consistently successful. So let's have a quick look at the, here at how we do this as an overview. So down the bottom here, this little robot guy, we have an agent that's installed and runs in your Cassandra process. We've had some people testing this. They ran it for about 10 months 
apps. They forgot to turn it off and it was sending data somewhere we forgot to check and they had no, didn't notice any performance impact. We've done some benchmarking. We've not been able to find a performance impact. And there's already some agents, Java agents, that run inside your Cassandra process. What that agent does is it looks at how the system has been used. We look for events such as a table's been created, a node went down, things like that or that it's just been a period of time. And then we'll collect the metrics and the schema. Uh, we'll look at the status in the gossip as to whether what nodes are, what node state we have. We'll look at the configuration of the operating system and its performance as well. We collect that and then periodically send that up to Vector, where Vector is running either in the cloud or on premise. We take that information, break it apart, and look for changes and try to understand what are the important changes that are happening? Now, we take that and run that through a series of rules that we have that are either heuristics, such as code, or algorithms, such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. We join that together with our expert knowledge to build this advice, and all to drive the situation so that you can come in in the morning and get the best experience the best expertise from data stacks. The system is built, Vector is made so that we can continually update it. And this happens when you're running on the cloud or when you're running on-premise. We'll find new things in the field. We're always there doing that as we're working with customers around the world. And we'll look at new features in Cassandra and we'll battle test them in the lab and understand the best way to use them and what it looks like when they're about to fail. And we codify that with our heuristics and our algorithms, we out the best way to explain it. And then push that out, and this is the great part, run that against every node that's in Vector. So it doesn't matter if that node's three years old, we'll go and run today's expertise against that. And then we'll do the same thing tomorrow if we update it. So as that is a way to set the scene, let's jump over to a demonstration and have a look at Vector in progress. This is Vector running and it's monitoring itself. It's an easy way to get things done. This is the initial dashboard. As a beta product, we're looking to be simple and consistent. We've got an overview of the clusters that we're running and here we just have one cluster and the different versions of that and the advice that we generate. We're gonna start by just jumping into some advice. In this menu here for advice, we can see Cassandra listed and if we're running with DSE, we'd see DSE listed there as well. Each piece of advice that we generate has a category, such as the configuration or performance or schema. And then we say whether we think it's critical or recommended that you follow it, or whether you've already done it. This is a system where we put some test data in and we try to find out that we're running, the rules running the way we expect them to. And some piece of advice may always be recommended or always be critical, or some may move between as the situation gets more complicated. We categorize it, and I just want to jump into a really simple one. By that, I mean the advice around the simple snitch. So I can click in, see the nodes that this impacts, and then go in and look at the detail. So for each piece of advice, we have a clear recommendation, what we, rec what we think you should do, a description of why as well. I think this is the important part. So why don't we want to use the simple snitch? Well, because it's got, doesn't have any configuration. It uh, doesn't allow us to control the placement of data centers and racks. And if you can control the placement of data centers and racks, it makes administration a lot easier. Well, that's great. And this is also a good time to understand the concept of what a snitch is because it sounds a bit weird, and the concept of data centers and racks in Cassandra. We think the best time for you to learn about something like this is when you need to know it to make your system better. So we give you this background. We give you an example, and we show the information that we use to make the decision. Pretty simple one here, just the configuration. We give you some version-sensitive help around how that config setting works and where you'll find it. And then a fix. So in this case, moving from the simple snitch to the gossiping property file snitch, 
it's kind of complicated. It takes a number, what have we got here, five steps to go through because you have to first configure the property file snitch, which we fall back to if the gossiping property file snitch can't work something out. And you know, just to uh, to add in of, of uh, one reason of why this is so important is that uh, Cassandra ships with the default uh, default settings for you to, to really just get up and running uh, as fast as you can, just get that cluster up um, and be able to be able to start to use it. But uh, but the decisions that you make early on in your cluster have a big impact. Um, and those uh, those handful of steps, especially when you're when you're first starting out, will only get more uh, more complex um, and more difficult to do later on. And so Vector is really there with you from the beginning uh, to help uh, help make sure that you have the right configurations uh, set up um, and uh, and have uh, have really uh, the ability to start off on the best foot with your cluster. Yeah, the the simple snitch is fine. Right, it all it does is it says every node is in, what do we say? Every node's in rack one and data center one, which is great. Uh, but if you're running on AWS, you would maybe want to set it up so that you could run multi-region and multi-AZ in the future. If you're on public, private cloud, if you're in that hybrid cloud environment or multi-cloud environment, you maybe want to use the gossiping property file snitch so that you can have some nodes in your private cloud, some nodes in your public cloud and replicate between them. And you can move from simple to gossiping property files niche relatively easily. Uh, just is a, takes some, a number of steps in there. Finding that out early on uh, is really important because it, the, it's easier to do with uh, when there's less pressure and less data in there. And this is a good example of just something that's the perceived wisdom that not everyone has access to because if you come to Cassandra as a new system, you don't have the experience. And that's really what we want Vector to give people is better knowledge, better experience as quickly as we can. Uh, so also what we have here is if this is a piece of config related just to one node. So if we needed this to, uh, if this change only had to apply on one node and not some others in the cluster, we'll demonstrate this here so you can understand the whole system and it applies to a node. So why don't we tell you what else we need to do for this node as well? We've got some other issues here that we can look into and maybe switch those around at the same time. So that's simple, but a, a gotcha that we want to make sure that you can fix before you get caught there. So the next thing I wanted to look at was some things that are uh, a little more eye candy. And we know Patrick likes his candy, so we're going to chat to Patrick around these. Uh, <laughs> I, I candy, yeah. I think we mentioned earlier <laughs> Swedish fish are fine, so go ahead and send those, yeah. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of monitoring, and we've been calling this opinionated monitoring. Uh, ad hoc monitoring where you can go and build a regression and do all sorts of great stuff, such as Datadog and Grafana are really useful. And it's really important to be able to monitor your database with your whole application. But sometimes not everyone has that, or it's, it's difficult to get access to for in all environments. So we've put some basic things in here. This is a key space that we're looking at. We can just see the currently what our ops per second and our latency is. And then the types of things we've wanted to look at as um, Cassandra professionals over the years is which tables have the most data? And so this is a simple, I think it's called a tree view, shows us that model of which tables have the most data. And we can look at that as well for throughput. So here are the tables with the highest read throughput and then the highest write throughput. And the uh, same for latency. So where are we spending most time on our read latency and on our write latency? And, and that's cluster that wide, right? Sorry, Patrick. I said, and that's cluster wide, right? Yeah. So not, this not is a single node. Definitely. This is aggregated on the tables across all of the clusters. And at the moment, it's giving you the sort of the view right now. So we'll work to add a time series into this as well. Uh, and just if you're walking up to someone else's cluster and you're trying to help them, um, understanding which tables have the most traffic or which have the highest latencies without having to resort to no tool. And as Patrick says, we aggregate across the whole cluster. 
I've managed clusters, looked at people's clusters at up to 600 nodes, picking the one that's having the most difficult, the node that's having the most difficulty and getting the actual values from it or identifying what the average is across the whole cluster gets hard if you're just hitting it with no tool. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. This is like, this is where, I mean, as someone, as, we, as we've all done managing large clusters, this is what separates uh, the mortals from people who, you know, you will fold so fast if you're <laughs> not prepared for how a distributed system works and, and having a tool that, that follows the rules of distributed systems. Like, yes, this is a cluster. However, every node is important. I, the amount of, uh, <laughs> I really wish I had this 10 years ago, Aaron. So I'm just going to tell you that yeah. right now. <laughs> sure would have made my life easier. <laughs> yeah, that's that was why we started making it, uh, to make everyone's life easier. So we bring all that together in this thing we call focus bubbles. And what we're looking to do here is contextualize how important a table is and focus on some performance aspect. So here, mm -hmm. each bubble is a table. The height of the table is the proportion of throughput, both read and write, that that table is getting for the whole key space. The left-right position is its read-write workload mix. And then the size of the bubble is the amount of data that it has compared to the whole key space. And then we color code mm -hmm. it based on the thing we want to look at. So here we're looking at at read latencies, the red bubbles are in the top 25th percentile. Now, it may be that they're not particularly slow, they're just the slowest. Now, I can shift and look at uh, write latency and see it's taking some time to write to this guy, and this guy. Uh, and we've used this with a few places and the ability to just quickly see, oh, look, all the read traffic's up here, but that's not the slowest part. Here's the slowest part and here's the slowest part. Is really valuable, and from an operator's pr perspective, it's uh, it's so great to be able to to compare these uh, these different fields side by side. Uh, again, without having to go into the command line and and just looking at, at rows of rows of numbers, vector uh, vector really lays that out for you. Yeah. So then, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, well, I was going to say, I mean, and you know, using something like Grafana, which is great for, you know, showing statistics in time series, this is a totally different perspective on, this is not a time series definition. This is, this is, hey, pay attention to this thing. Um, it gives, I think, an operator a really quick glance. I mean, if you look at a Grafana screen and can glean meaning out of it immediately, then you're a professional. But if you're not, and you can look at something like this, just in seconds, know exactly what's up. Yeah, exactly. And now click in here and drill into this table, have a look at the table configs and the columns. And you were talking before about which nodes doing which traffic. So here we've got a bit of a mismatch in our traffic load here. We could look at the load, uh, the traffic throughput. We can look at the load per node as well. That idea that you do have a cluster of machines. It is a distributed system. You can have one out of 10 things misbehaving. And how do you identify those? As we look at the advice later on, uh, you know, some of the advice we have looks at how a node performs relative to the whole cluster. So we might look at, hey, does this node have more data in this table than we would expect given all the other nodes? Or is it getting more traffic for this particular table than the others? Or does it have more client connections? Or is its configuration different than what we expect given all the other nodes in the cluster? Understanding that it's a distributed system is, is a key part. So I'm going to jump out a little bit there, though, and look at security. Now, uh, we always talk about security. Uh, we love to make sure that everybody's got their data nice and secure. And here's a real simple one, that the Cassandra user is a super user. And we look at that and determine we should probably turn that guy off. And here we've looked at the fact that we do have a password authenticator running. Uh, we've looked at the fact that the Cassandra role is enabled. And we've given you a fix here about how to disable that. Uh, the security in Cassandra changed a bit over 3.0 and became a bit more um, role-based. And so it's got slightly complicated. But it's something that I think we really as a community want to get more people focused on. 
that this that. feature right here could probably save jobs <laughs> yeah <laughs> because mm -hmm. i i think of like this is one thing that you really don't security is always the last thing right and if this is right in front of you uh this is great yeah and and then cassandra uh enabling security once you're running is a bit easier now but it used to be almost impossible uh it used to require downtime because it's particularly if your client uh, had to talk securely to the servers in the old days, the only way to do that was to stop all the servers, configure them to require the client to have authentication, and then bring them back up and have the clients all start to have authentication. You can roll that out now. It's still more complicated to do it on a running system than to catch it early on, maybe in your QA systems, and uh, start to have security be something you're running all the time. Right. So we've looked at some advice that's around configuration. We've looked at some advice that's around uh, security. The big thing that we always talk about with Cassandra, of course, is schema and data modeling. And it's one of those difficult on-ramps for new users to come in. So I'm going to look at the, some schema advice that we have here against their system. Particularly, I'm going to look at this one around the, the use of SQL collection types. Uh, now, these are really handy things. I remember when they were added because we don't have, you know, we didn't have indexes back then or that they, they, they work in sort of different ways to a relational engine. If you just wanted to store the email addresses that a user has, that's what they were designed for. And often just knowing that is a really powerful thing for developers. So here, our recommendation is that we've noticed that we're using a collection type. We just want to make sure you understand as a developer that it's for denormalizing small amounts of data. I think as a rule of thumb, if somebody else gets to decide, like a, another piece of software or a user, how much data goes into that collection type, then it should probably be a table unless you're going to limit it. And again, we want to explain to you why. So we've got an example here of how lists work and they, uh, they may create duplicate data if you're doing replays through your application tier. There's some information on how TTLs work and data purging. And the general concept of collections and how they're implemented in Cassandra, giving you some links here, even to go and look at the tickets that generate that added it, or tickets around this behavior here of how many elements you can have in here giving you all the background that you need. I think the best time, as we said before, to learn about collection types is when you need to do something with them. Uh, reading books is great, going to training is great, uh, but then we always contextualize that learning and that's the best time. So for this one, we looked at the column here and for our fix, we know this is a map and we can't tell you exactly how to change it. This is an example, if you've got a map how I could change this map to be do two different tables. And in general sense, how I would then make that fix, I'd have to backfill the data, switch the application over, and then drop that column. And if it was a set, here's a data modeling example for a set. And if it was, uh, uh, what's this one, a list, here's a data modeling example about how I'd take that list out. And this goes back to earlier where we were talking about those decisions that you make right at the beginning have a big impact on your cluster. Having the right data model is, uh, is, is a key part of, uh, of making sure that, uh, that your cluster is performant. You know, Patrick and Aaron have both given a lot of talks um, uh, on this subject. And having Vector there for, um, uh, for your people who are using Cassandra uh, right at day one uh, helps to uh, to overcome that and and understand what are collections good for, what are they not, what are they not good for, um, and and really build up this continuous uh, continuous education uh, for for Cassandra. Yeah, you know, Patricia, that is the part that I I love the most is you could actually be actively learning. This is active learning. This isn't passive where you're sitting there watching. A, uh, you know, just another course on data modeling that you have to retain that information. This is active, like it tells you, hey, here's a change you need to make. And that is really super cool because that's now I can make some actions. And this is when I when I first saw this, Aaron first showed me this, I, I fell out of my chair because this almost makes my job over. I, I have to find a new job. Like teaching people data modeling is done. 
Sorry, but you know, <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we still we'll still need you for some things, Patrick. You're not you're not completely automated away. You know, people still have to get started on it, and it's this. I, people get started and they play, and then understand. Well, this worked on my laptop. Yeah. I, when I was at Weather Digital, there was uh, you know, thirty-five thousand cores of execution in the render farm, and it worked on my desktop. Where shorthand for I just blew up the farm because I didn't think about exact what it was to run that at a thousand nodes at a time. And, and a similar story with databases, right? If it works on my desktop, on my laptop, how's that going to then work six months later on a sixty-node cluster doing a million ops a second? That's the stuff that that experience teaches you, and we want to get that information to you as soon as we can because it's it's easier to learn at the beginning than fix a mistake. It really is. My, and Vector, um, oh, and Vector is yeah. really giving you that expert advice. Uh, the brain from all of the brains, the collective brains and knowledge from data stacks, right, uh, right to you. That experience right there at your fingertips. My, I think my record is a gigabyte that somebody put into uh, a set. And that didn't exactly go too well for them. Patrick, have you got a record on that one? Um, yeah, I actually had someone create a database of a database with a map. I'm not, it was over a gig, <laughs> uh, but it was pretty impressive how they figured out how to make it a database inside of a database. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's, a, it's there. It is not illegal. It's just, it's a bad yeah. idea. And, but this kind of tool is like, well, and this is why which is so yeah, much I, better than me saying I'd, no. I had friends in the 90s laugh at me because I generated HTML in a SQL Server transaction and then returned that out to serve on a web page. So it's easy to go and get carried away. And I can understand that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stupid human tricks. We do them every yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good fun. And, we'll ex and what we've got here is the ability to expand this out. I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we think about when we're talking about being consistently successful is what happens when new features come along. Uh, you know, those materialized views, they come along, they work in some situations not so well in others. There might be new indexing technology, uh, user defined types. All the new things that come along, we'll battle test those as we always do and understand the best ways. But previously, that communication, as Patrick said, was uh, webinars and training materials and blog posts and reading. And you never knew if it applied to you because you had to go out and look for it. What we're going to do here is say, hey, there's another way to do this. Um, you know, this is a frozen set, I think, that we looked at. So letting people understand, hey, you don't have to freeze all of your collection types you did in, when they were first created. You don't have to after a certain version. New changes like that is the stuff we can push out every day. And also, uh, uh, when talking about education and continual learning of, of um, uh, and that experience that comes with working with Cassandra, I mean, Vector is really putting the why uh, right uh, right there for you, so that that you can take that and um, uh, and build on that. Because you can't you can't optimize if you don't if you don't understand why something is happening in the first place. Yeah, and, and as I get older, I fall asleep more. So keeping it to sort of contextualize, it's something I, I need to know now, and it's uh, you know a five or ten minute read. I'll, I'll stay awake for that. Okay, so we've looked now at some configuration. We've looked at some security. We've looked at some schema. Uh, let's look at something that until a couple of weeks ago, Patrick didn't even know existed, and we have to thank a, a guy called Redavan who. Uh, worked at, in the Cassandra team at Spotify, worked at TLP, now works at Datastax for his level of expertise, uh, was brought this one to our attention a couple of years ago. And it's Completely a complicated, yeah, it's a complicated story. And I'm probably not going to do it great justice. If you look at the blog post on datastax.com that we wrote for the announcement, uh, we linked to the blog post there on the last pickle that Radovan wrote a couple of years ago to explain this, but it's a relationship between the max hint window configuration setting, which controls when a node goes down, how long will we continue to collect hints for? The GC grace seconds, which you may know from its kind of starring role as when you delete data, this is the minimum amount of time it stays before compaction is able to purge it. It also has the secondary role 
when we collect hints, this is the time to live for the hints and they will not be replayed after this expires. So we'll pull them off disk still when we see that node come back up, but then we'll drop them, won't send them back. And how those two things interact, that's one story. And then there's another one which is about has to do with the time to live. If you have a default TTL on your table, you also want to get those that information around so that it can, if I write something with a default TTL that I previously didn't, or maybe had some data, then added the default TTL, now I do a write. That second write that I've done needs to eventually over, um, you know, shadow, as we call it internally, the first write and make sure that that original value is gone. But if we don't deliver those hints because it timed out, that's not going to happen. So we've got three variables we need to adjust and we need to look at. And we kind of want to do this every time we look at a data model. And that's even when you know this stuff, is is the thing you should be automating because you won't that, remember to look at a 60 table key space and check every table. That is what blew me away is like, this is the kind of information that is what I would call hiddenly critical. And it's it's not an everybody problem, but it's in it's of nature of a distributed system and a complex system like Cassandra that should be somewhat automated with a tool like Vector, because it's just it's not enough capacity for me to remember every little detail about a database. And man, this is this is the game changer part of Vector. Is yeah. it really makes this kind of stuff easy? And how did that happen? It just blows me away. And, and there are times legitimately where you may reduce GC gray seconds. I think a lot of operators, um, when you're having those horrible tombstone problems, and we also check for that, you know, the, the standard operating procedure is, hey, drop your GC gray seconds so that those tombstones, now you've adjusted your workload and you're not generating tombstones, you need to get the old ones off, drop the GC gray seconds, push your compaction a bit fast, a bit harder so that it purges all those tombstones and then brings it back up. There's some legitimate reasons you may want to do it. Do you understand all the implications now you're making an informed decision and then you know to, what you should be keeping an eye on during that phase of where you're doing it? Or have you just accidentally stumbled across something because you didn't fully understand all the implications of GC Grace? Um, so this one here, we've, we've discovered this. It's actually in the, an, an old table in Reaper. I'll have a chat to Alex uh, around Reaper and just let him know. Here, the, the things we've looked at, we've got, looked at the max hint window from configuration and we've looked at our table here. Uh, we see the default TTL and our uh, GC gray seconds at 120 seconds. Um, this one here, we're recommending, hey, we can increase our GC gray seconds. We've got the exact setting to use, change the default TTL. And there's a there's two two parts to this problem where it could be that you don't have a default TTL, but you do have the GC gray seconds less than the max hint window. And in that case, we'd want you to change the max hint window, but here that's not an issue. So we say it's not applicable. Um, we don't you don't need to do that. And Aaron, where where is Vector looking to get all of this information? Where does it pull the the info from? So the the agent as I said, sits in there and listens to how Cassandra's used, collects data and sends it. And we want to make sure you understand what we're doing to make that decision. So it's this configuration setting, should have some help on this hopefully around what that is uh, and the, the table settings here. And we use that to make our decision. And hopefully then, you know, as you're going through this, you're learning in the same way as if you were sitting next to myself or Patrick and we were doing a one-on-one -on -one data modeling course with you and working through it. Okay, so we've looked at, what have we looked at? We've looked at some simple configuration things. We've looked at some security things. We've looked at our schema and data modeling and some sort of advanced expert level uh, catches that, that, we'll, that we find out there in the field looked at how they can work together and to give you a good understanding hopefully and on the job training and you know day-to-day -day training and 
that there's some nice eye candy that helps you identify which tables are the most critical for you to look at. So what I'd like to do now is just drop out of my demo and we'll just look at what those benefits are. So we think there's four parts here. We've got the automated advice and those customized fixes to help you learn and help you keep your systems performant and available. We've got continuous updates from data stacks and we don't, I don't think we really pushed on this enough, but as I said in the beginning, we continually will codify our best experience and expertise using algorithms and heuristics, and then we can push those out and test that against every node that's in vector, whether you're in the cloud or on-prem. With the best intentions, if we find something in the, you know, as we're testing a new feature, we can't pick up the phone and speak to every customer and just ask them to go out and check every key space and cluster they've got. But we can do that with Vector. We've got some nice hands-off management so you can look at aggregated information across your cluster. You can look at some opinionated monitoring to give you ideas of throughput, latency, and load. And the focus bubbles to bring all that together to look at schema and configuration. And there's a history of the changes of those things as well. And then together, this helps us build skills. So we're looking to build skills for developers and operators at all levels across your whole team. And as we do that, we hope that it improves everyone's abilities, but it also means that the experts in your organization spend less time firefighting as we're catching things early. And it gives them more time to make new things rather than fix the old things. So with that, I'd like to remind you if you go to datastacks.com, you'll find more information. And there's a sign-up form there that you can use to learn more as we go through the beta process. And we're looking for those great customers out there, enterprises and users have really interesting problems. Patrick, over to you. I was going to say, I hope we have Cassandra backing up that web form because I'm sure it's getting killed right now because I, Come on, if, you're, if you don't want to use Vector, then you probably don't want to use Cassandra, right? <laughs> and it's great to have the old team back together again, Aaron and Patricia. I mean, uh, this is just uh, this is a great bit of nostalgia for me too. I mean, we've been doing this for a while, right? Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to dive into some questions. So these are questions that were submitted and uh, I think you got everyone's attention. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at these. Um, Let's see here. All right, first and foremost, uh, Aaron. So who in my company would benefit from using Vector? Is this for operators, developers, or managers? I'm going to go with everyone, Patrick. Um, so for yeah? developers, yes, and, and I think I can stand by that. For developers, we've got schema advice, and my Big thing is that developers need to know more about how computers work and operators need to know more about how to make applications. Catching it with developers early on and letting them understand schema, being able to do a performance test and understand how that's impacting and get Vector to give you some advice on that as you're in going through your different stages of development there. If you've got a QA or, or a lower production environment, catching it there uh, for operators, being able to walk up and understand what's important in a cluster straight away with the advice or with uh, focus bubbles. And then for managers, you know, um, a lot of the time when we speak to decision makers and managers, they're worried about, do we have the right skills to drive this thing? I keep hearing it's complicated. Uh, and what progress are we making? All right, are we getting better? Mm -hmm. And Vector helps us understand if we're getting better by with just ticking off that list. We're giving, giving everyone a list, checking it twice and ticking it off. Uh, so I think it's going to help everyone, every organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and Patricia, I, I'm going to drag you into this too, because you're, you're a consultant with Cassandra. Um, is this something you're going to, who are you going to recommend this to? You can say the same, but... <laughs> 
That, well, my answer is the same of everyone really can benefit from uh, from using this. And from from an operator perspective, I mean, having uh, having this expert advice and knowledge uh, right there at your fingertips is something that is uh, is really a game changer um, uh, to help people learn how to use Cassandra, learn how Cassandra works um, as uh, as they're doing it. So this is something that if you use Cassandra in any way, you want to be using Vector. You you are going to want uh, the help from Vector. Cool. I agree with what right, you said. Yeah, <laughs> it's always a good idea. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, so this question: How do we secure the data? I'm assuming that's the data that's going into Vector. Maybe that we'll just say that. Yeah. Okay. So, what yeah. what what about that? Really sensitive around that. We make sure when we're collecting configs, we don't touch you know part of that Cassandra YAML file has some passwords and paths mm. even just to key store files we don't catch those we don't collect the logs either because uh, we don't control what goes into a log line anybody can write a log message in the code base and there are log messages that are useful that come out that say uh, this table has a really big row and here's the partition key for that now that partition key is your user data and we don't want to capture that we don't catch, we might catch the exception type, but not the message description because we're again, we don't control that. And somebody could put something in there that's useful if you are inside the firewall debugging. Uh, we don't want to take any of your user data out. So the agent is sensitive there. We take the data, we upload it via HTTPS, uh, we encrypt it on the wire, we encrypt. Uh, at rest inside the vector system, and we disassociate it a bit from your customer. You know, we make sure that we don't store that it's uh, you know, bobstravelcompany.com with every piece of data. We disassociate it so that it's just against the token and we keep that information elsewhere. All right. Um, and that's a great answer. I'm sure that's exactly what they wanted to hear. Not like, mm -hmm. oh, no, we got it all. That would be another <laughs> cloud provider. <clears throat> anyway, um, so. Does the agent, so assuming I, this has an agent in it, but does the agent yep. impact node performance? And I'm pretty sure that someone who has experience with something like an op center or even, well, anything that really inquires an agent that can, when they go off the rails, it's bad. Yeah, and uh, spending nine years helping people run systems around the world, and a lot of as we designed this was, what would make me recommend that somebody should uninstall it? Yeah, so we've made the agent as as unintrusive as we can. You know, sometimes when you hear Java agent, people think about a, a new relic or an app dynamics that instruments the JVM intermediate language. We don't do that. We're uh, in there. There are other agents already running inside your your, your Cassandra process, as I said. Uh, we had somebody run it for 10 months. They didn't notice anything, notice anything. We've done performance tests, and we haven't found any impact. And the agent itself has a lot of bunch of code in there that is, hey, if I think I've just raised an error and, I, and I'm going to catch my own errors, uh, it shuts itself down. And, and it also has code in there to make sure that it's not keep on trying to do the same thing again and again. So we've been very sensitive to no performance. Yeah, I think that's that's a good answer too, because there is um, that is a common problem. Um, okay, so. I think this is a great question because this I think this is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, so is this software as a service central somewhere or do I can I use this on prem? I think that probably goes back to the security question a bit. So what's yeah. the answer there? Both. Both because we know that there are some organizations that they need to keep things inside their firewall or inside their legal jurisdiction uh, that they need to own it. Um, so it's a cloud multi-tenant cloud service we just install the agent it's one jar and one config file and i should say that agent it's the same jar for dse and cassandra and for every version that we support you don't have to change it just because you upgrade your system we put in a bunch of effort to make sure that was the case so when you're running on cloud simple install and you're away. If you're running on-prem, it's a Kubernetes install. And with these, some of our early beta customers are 
uh, large corporates that were testing that out on prem to get it installed. We love Kubernetes, as you know, you know, the Kubernetes operator and all the love we're giving there. Um, we're living that as well by making systems that run Kubernetes. That is, so I keep saying it's a good answer, but that's the correct answer. It runs in yep. Kubernetes. <laughs> yep. it's all, that's awesome. It's all in there. We love it. It's the best thing ever. That's, that's going to make a lot of operators happy. Um, okay, so uh, around, you know, there's obviously some some great stuff in here for open source Cassandra, but what about DSE? Does it support uh, DataStax Enterprise and some of the advanced workloads, the different parts, and um, does it do mixed workloads? How does it handle that? Yeah, so the last three months have been getting up to speed and getting it integrated into DSE. We support the 5X and the 6X versions of DSE mentioned going as we're going through that demo. If we had DSE running there, you see that is another menu item. You can look at your combined estate of DSE and Cassandra or separate it out as DSE and Cassandra. We have not built any new rules for the advanced workload parts, graph, search, analytics. We've got some rules specifically for the core DSE for your thread per core and that type of thing. Uh, but it will work on those systems. We don't give specific advice for those advanced workloads yet. Okay, and this is probably based on the question I around the thing where I was saying it's not just another time series chart, but then, then there's a question, what about that? Is there history? Yeah. Can we do time range on charts? Not yet, but we really, really want to. Uh, I keep on... Um, having to stop the developers from doing it uh, so we can build build some other things. We keep a 30-day history, a 30-day mm -hmm. rolling window, and we also understand what the most recent values there are. The charts at the moment are static, as in what it's like now or what it was for a one-day trend. Uh, but we are really excited. This is the bit that the developers are uh, keep on wanting to do is, hey, can we go and animate those focus bubbles and show how things changed over the last day or week or month? That's what we want to do. So yeah, time series, but cool. again, this opinionated, <laughs> yeah, this opinionated, it'd be just like your own little um, TED talk, right? You can be there, do a presentation and show how this little table kind of went up to the top and went red. Um, so. Yes, we want to get the time series on there, but in this opinionated monitoring way that we're not looking to build an ad hoc kind of uh, you know, monitoring platform. What we're looking to do is what makes sense for a developer and an operator of Cassandra. That would be really awesome, TED Talk. How I, yes. as a single <laughs> operator, ran a 10,000 node cluster, <laughs> blah, 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 cute graph. Thank you for attending my TED Talk. <laughs> I think we should see this happen. There's some limited audience for that one. It's maybe a TEDx. Yeah. Maybe it has to be a TEDx. TEDx. Yeah, sure. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So I think this is a this is a question that probably has a funny story behind it. Funny, not so funny story. <laughs> but what about supporting checks for certificate expiration? <laughs> and yeah. If you can help me out, tell me the story and the question because I know this is a good one. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, not yet, but we built the model, built the engine, so that as we're working through um, our with our our great teams on support and engineering, we've got I think eight different security things we're looking at at the moment. So do you have your node-to-node -node encryption enabled? Do you have your client-server encryption enabled? And uh, you know, do you have your uh, role-based access set up properly? Client authentication, all that type of stuff. The next thing is, okay, let's got it running. Stories like this, hey, we found that someone once had this issue, they had a 10 node old cluster or whatever. You know, it's how long did they set the expiry on that certificate and think that'll be someone else's problem? Like this thing won't run for five years, five years. I mean, who, who could imagine a database running for that long in the early days of Cassandra? That's just the sort of thing that we start to add on there is you know, how do we how do we sensitively gather that information off the agent um, so, so we we're doing that 
in a trust model, take that back and and let you know, hey, you've got some certificates or that are going to expire. And we're able to add that as on the fly and then push that out to you. You know, I'm, I'm just thinking of um, our good friend in the community, Carlos Rolo, who's given a couple of talks on Cassandra um, archaeology, where the poor guy as a consultant has found some of the oldest running clusters on the planet. Like last year, his record was a 1.0, like something cluster. Yeah. And yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it looks like we're out of time and there are more questions, but, um, you know, just that's cool. We will, we'll pull those out. We usually do a really good job of, you know, following up with the questions, but, um, I mean, I really want to thank you, Aaron, for this pretty incredible demo. I mean, I I hope people are clicking on the sign up right away. <laughs> um, and Patricia, it's always great to be in another webinar with you or just hanging out. Thanks for being at DataStax. Um, that's this has been a really uh, really good day for bringing back the old team to talk about what the new team's going to do. So um, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you all. Thank you.